Hello everyone, greetings once again. I know it's been a couple weeks. I've been gone one week and last week we had a guest speaker and we didn't try to uh, do a video that would uh, duplicate his message because that wouldn't have been right. So uh, when I say duplicate his message, I would have done something different and didn't want to confuse any people from the church. So. We uh, move forward right now. We're going back to Psalm 139. We started this back on December 31st, and um, we're going to look at Psalm 139 over the next three weeks after this one, four weeks, and consider what this passage, what it says in a very relevant, uh, personal way, because there's something very special here. So, I'm going to pray as I start, like I normally do, and ask God to guide and guard to provide for us that we can hear clearly and understand what this passage is saying. We can make applications, and we need to ask God for that help. We need to ask our Heavenly Father. He is, he is sovereign. He's in charge, and we look to Him for the strength we need day in and day out. So let's bow before Him, please. Our Father and our God, I thank you that you are, that you are here with us. You promised through what we see in Psalm 139 that um, you're, you know us deeply and, and, and definitely. Uh, you know us better than we know ourselves. That's really what we're considering today. And we thank you, Father, for your presence and for your provisions for us. For Jesus Christ, who came to pay the price for our sins, we praise you for that wonderful reality. None of us deserve that. And we understand that you provided for us because we couldn't do this for ourselves. And so thank you, dear Father. Thank you for your scriptures, your word. Help us to live by the truth of what the Bible teaches us. Help us to see the applications that are relevant to our lives. This book from Genesis to Revelation is very particularly uh, reliable and it is relevant to everything that we do. We need to look to you for your help. We need to look to you for your instructions. And Father, I ask that you would guide us, us as we do that, guide as I speak today to try to provide insights from this powerful passage of Scripture in Psalm 139. Again, I thank you for your provisions for us, Father, the Holy Spirit who indwells our lives, the fact that Jesus Christ has provided the forgiveness that's necessary. The fact that we have your word that shows us what we need to do in most every circumstance that we face. There are very few things that are not addressed by the scriptures. So thank you for that, Father. And I ask now that as I speak from Psalm 139, they will use this, that we might be men and women of the book. That we might be people who are allowing the Bible to transform our thinking and to transform the way that we live our lives. Help us in that. I pray that you will uh, use this, Father, for your glory and for your honor, please. And I ask this in Jesus' wonderful, powerful name. And again, all God's people would say, Amen. Thank you. All right. As we consider today where we're going, Psalm 139. Powerful passage of Scripture. And uh, as we get started, I just want to point out that there are certain concerns that are raised by different polls and surveys that are done of American people. And there's recently been one that was done of pastors, and they report that there are many, many pastors in this country that are discouraged. And a majority of pastors, sadly, are considering leaving the ministry. Why is that? Because our culture is so chaotic. Our culture is so confused. Our so culture is so conflicted that people have problems like they've never had before. At least it seems to us that way. Maybe these things happened years ago, too. I think there are cycles in history. But nonetheless, there is so much going on right now that is discouraging and defeating as far as the faith is concerned. And we should never be discouraged. We should never be defeated when we recognize that Christ came. He paid what was needed to be paid for our sins. He promised us his presence for the rest of our lives if we're truly trusting him. And we, we have reason to be excited. We have reason to be encouraged. But the sad thing is, is the culture is oftentimes pushing against us. 
And I think there are two very troubling challenges that are facing our culture and then also facing the church. Number one, practical atheism. I mentioned this three weeks ago. Practical atheism is living as if God doesn't have authority over the details of our lives. It is a me-centered experience where I don't understand that God has something to say and I need to hear it and I need to obey it. And so many people in this culture, they live a life that says, let's pretend God doesn't exist. And practical atheism is, is a real thing. It, it happens. It, it, it goes on all around us. It's on, it goes on outside the church. Sadly, it goes on inside the church. I even read this week where a certain pastor, he acknowledged himself saying, you know what, I think I've been a victim at times of practical atheism. And maybe I have too. I'm, I, I've not analyzed that in a particular way. I seek always to look to what the Bible says and what God would want. But yet I realize that I'm a sinner saved by grace. And because of my sin nature, sometimes I, I slip. Sometimes I may not have the perspective I ought to have. So practical atheism is real. Secondly, there's this sense of personal awareness that is a problem, too. That is a challenge to our culture and to the church. What is it? Well, our society is facing an identity crisis. People don't know who they are. They don't know what they should be doing. There are men that think there are women. There are women that think there are men. There are various other disoriented issues and concerns. And basically, what we find is that because of what God's Word teaches us, our true identity, who we are, the persons that we were created to be, can only be found when we acknowledge our Creator, God Almighty, and when we submit to His authority. That's the only, ways, the only way that our true identity can be found. And sadly, there are many people that profess, yes, I believe in Jesus. Believing in Jesus may not simply be enough. Why do I say that? Because Jesus says in, in Matthew 7, these, there are going to be people that are going to come to him on the day of judgment or on their day of judgment. And when they come before him, Jesus is going to say, be away from me. I never knew you. And they say, wait a minute now, I, I, I cast out demons in your name and I did all kinds of things for you. And Jesus is going to say, I'm sorry, but be away from me. I never knew you. That's one of the scariest verses in the Bible. And yet we realize that there's this personal awareness issue where people fail to acknowledge the creator as the authority and they do not submit in, an order, in order to obey him. They don't realize that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and life, the only way. And he's not only the Savior that died on the cross for our sins, but he must be the Lord of our lives. He must take charge of us. Now, the remedy for these concerns that I've, ish, ish, I've, I've, I've expressed, practical atheism and personal awareness, the, the, the remedy for these concerns is an accurate, biblically-based understanding of God. We cannot understand ourselves until we understand our Creator. We can't understand ourselves until we know exactly what the Creator has provided for us. And the only answer is that we need Jesus Christ, we need God, we need to understand who He is and what He's done. And I think, you know, it's interesting, Garden of Eden, thousands of years ago, yes, 4,000 years ago or so, the serpent came to Eve, and he said, Has God not said? Has God not said? In fact, I've got my Bible open in Genesis chapter 3. It says, The serpent came, and he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat of any tree of the garden? He tossed out this deceptive temptation to her. Look at the tree in the center that you're told not to eat. And Eve was deceived. She was distracted. And therefore, she fell into sin because she ate from the fruit and she gave of her husband, gave to her husband. And we have in that the fact that there is a lack of understanding of who God is and what God desires. That's how sin came into the world. 
And the question that we need to ask ourselves sometimes, am I living a God-centered experience or am I living a me-centered, a man-centered experience? I think way too often we are failing to live that God-centered experience that we actually we find in, 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 in uh, Psalm 139. In one, Psalm 139, written by David, we don't know the exact occasion why David wrote this. It could have been in one of the crises in his life. It could have been in one of the times when he was living fervently for the Lord and serving him in an effective manner. It could have been another time of his life. We don't know. But David wrote it. It says, a psalm of David for the choir director. And as we read the passage itself, what we're looking at today, today we're looking at the first six verses only. And it says, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You understand my thought from afar, from a distance. You scrutinize my path and my lying down. You are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all. You have enclosed me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I can never attain it. I can't grasp it, is what David is saying. And as we look at these six verses, I want us to understand that this passage is telling us basically that he knows us better than we know ourselves. And he wants us to know him. He wants us to understand who he is. He wants us to see him as he, as he, as he, as he personally is in his sovereign, authoritative perspective. So, an accurately, biblically-based understanding of who God is is such a need. That's what we're looking at. And we realize that people in our culture today, people throughout all history, they have manufactured gods of their own making. There were idols back in the Old Testament, idols probably in the New Testament. There were idols all the way through history. The idols in our world today are not necessarily graven images. Sometimes they are. But oftentimes the idols are various desires we have, various interests that we have, various things that we say, okay, this is most important. This is the priority that I've set. And oftentimes what happens, practical atheism and personal awareness become an issue because we look for gods that we can manage, we look for gods that we can manipulate, we look for gods that we can manufacture. And in Psalm 19, it says, the heavens declare the glories of God. It says in Romans chapter 1, the creation has presented for each of us the reality of God's existence. We all have an awareness of God from birth on. That's what the Bible says. And yet, people are consistently looking for their idols. They're looking for a God that they can manage. They don't want a sovereign God that controls. That's not what people want. The uh, evolutionary theories, Charles Darwin, he was maybe a scientist, I read stories, I've read, read his history and that, and yes, he claimed to be a scientist of sorts, but the reality is, is Charles Darwin, he was more of an agnostic, and he was wanting to rid his life of any perspective or any understanding of who God was. And basically, if he created this evolutionary theory, then he could eliminate God and God's morals from the picture. And there you go. People are trying to man manufacture, they're trying to manipulate, they're trying to maneuver around the idea of God Almighty, and they're trying to manage the God that they worship. Now, I don't want to worship a God that I can manage. I want to be managed by the God that I worship. In, Pro in Psalm 139, verses 1 through 6 that I read a little bit ago, it provides for us six essential truths that encourage us to submit to the Lord's sovereign authority over our lives. Six truths, they, they encourage us. I submit, I, 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 I fall down and worship God Almighty. That's what he's saying there. That's what the, David is saying. And in these six verses, he concludes there and says, the idea of God's knowledge 
of me, that's David speaking, he says, it's too wonderful, it's too high, it's beyond what I can fully attain. And we're going to see what we can grasp from that today. But now at first, we see first off, number one, God knows everything I do. It says it right there in the passage. Oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You understand my thought from afar. And in that section right there, we realize that God knows everything that we do. He sees it all. Nothing escapes his notice. Nothing is going to get by God. There is no way that I can ever deceive God. And when it says we've been searched and known by God, that means that he has an intimate and intensive knowledge of our lives. He knows us inside and out. He knows us backwards and forwards. He knows all the smallest details of our lives. And he knows everything, every action, every reaction, every motive, every attitude. He knows everything about us. And he has this extensive knowledge. And just think, this passage, it's easy for us to grasp the idea that, okay, God has knowledge of all the people in the world. When I say that, yes, 8 billion people, that's not easy to grasp, but yet... That seems so comprehensive. And therefore, God has knowledge of all 8 billion people. That's good. But yet, God is personal. And he not only has knowledge of all 8 billion people, but he has knowledge of us in a personal, private manner. And he knows us intimately and personally. Comprehensively, he knows all 8 billion people. And he's known every person that's ever lived. He's kept records. It says in Daniel, it says in the book of Revelation that the books are going to be opened. And they're going to be shown, there's going to be shown that God knows all. But the reality is, is when we look at this, this is an individual, this is a personal setting that David is describing. And he has this intimate, intensive knowledge of us personally. And nothing escapes God's attention. And you know, it's interesting as we, you know, last week, uh, two weeks ago, I should say, Donna and I took a trip. And we were going to go have, have basically our late Christmas celebration with our family. And as we um, went to where we were going, we went to a place where we'd, we'd, we'd been close to this place before we'd never been to where we were going. It was a place in Chicago. And as we were observant as far as where we were and what was, you know, what it was, you know, it's interesting. There were things that caught our attention as we were, as we were there. And we realized, well, you know, maybe we've been here before, but I never noticed that. I never noticed this. So we as human beings, you know, things escape our notice. Things we don't see with God, there's nothing that escapes his notice. He knows everything I do. But now secondly, God knows everything I think. Again, notice what it says. You have searched me and known me. That's looking at our actions. So that's looking at our attitudes. That's looking at our mindset. He says, you know when I sit down, when I rise up, you understand my thought from afar. God knows everything I think. And everything that goes through my mind, God's aware of that. That's, that's, in a sense, a scary thought. Did you ever sit? I used to sit in school sometimes when I was, I remember in fifth grade, there were times when I, I would be daydreaming and, and I'd not be listening to the teacher or something like that. And, uh, you know, the, the teacher may call on me and, oh, wait, whoa, you know, and, 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 and the reality is, is I wasn't listening to their lecture so as the teacher asked the question, I couldn't answer the question. But the other aspect of that is, is, you know, what was going through my mind? And God was aware of what was going through my mind. God knew it full out. He did. And God knows everything that goes through our mind. In Matthew 5, we're told that, you know, if we, if we have thoughts of love for someone, God knows that. 
And that's a good thing in a certain sense. But what if that love turns into a lust? It says, if you lust in your heart, according to what God sees, as he sees our thoughts, as he understands our thoughts, he says, you've already committed adultery. Or if you have a thought of hatred or anger towards someone, that's almost like murder. And God knows those things. He's aware of those things. God knows everything that I think. He knows my longings. He knows my loyalties. He knows the things that I love. He knows the areas where I might lust, where I might want something that is not mine. God's aware of all of that. And as I look at the, the, the various instructions and commands that God's given, he warns us about coveting. He warns us about seeking things that we ought not have. He warns us in those areas, and God's aware of all of that. He knows every secret, every secret thing in, in, in our things that we keep from others, the things we don't talk about, the things we don't mention. God's aware of every secret. He's aware of every motive. He knows if our motives are manipulative. He knows if our motives are pure. He knows every idea that floats through that mind of ours. And we need to understand that, as it says there, God is aware. He's attentive. Nothing escapes. But now we see, thirdly, he says, You scrutinize my path and my lying down and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. The two words in there that we look at, actually three words we're going to look at, but two I want to mention now, is my path and my ways. Both of those Hebrew words are talking about the places where we go, you know, the, 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 the road that we're taking, the, uh, the map that we're following, so to speak. And he's saying, he scrutinizes, and he scrutinizes my path and my lying down. He knows when I'm active, and he knows when I'm stopping. He knows if I'm heading somewhere. He knows if I'm planning to go somewhere, and I don't. He knows if I said I'm going somewhere and I don't. He scrutinizes. That word scrutinize, I want to take a look at that word for a moment. That word basically means to sift out for an accurate measure. And I don't know a lot about, I, in fact, when I basically cook something or bake something and follow the recipes, I'm not the main cook and she, I, I'm the chief bottle washer in our house. I wash dishes, but I don't do all the cooking, obviously. But, you know, sometimes flour, flour recipe for cake or, or something says you sift the flour. Now, I've never completely understand why you sift the flour. I guess you're making it fluffy, yes. But one of the reasons why you sift it from what I gather, I looked this up, is to get a perfect measure, an accurate measurement because you need an accurate measurement. And, you know, the Lord sifts through our pathways. He measures our pathways. He's looking at closely and seeing what, it, what, what it's all about. And when it ties to our thoughts and our actions, God is weighing all those things and he's looking at those things and he, wrecked, he keeps record of that. It says he's intimately familiar with all our ways, with all the different destinations that we have, the things on our bucket list or whatever else. And the thing is, is intimately familiar, it means that he is well acquainted. He is accustomed. He knows what we're going to do long before we do it. Because he knows us inside and out. He knows us better than we know ourselves. And there's a certain here aspect of this that, again, 8 billion people, God is attentive to all but yet this passage of Scripture is looking at it very, very personally. There's a personal nature of God's attention. He looks at me. He looks at you. He's aware. And it's kind of like, you know, when, you, when you're looking at a map on, on your phone or you're looking at a map on the computer, when you have that map in the, in the, uh, uh, the tightest way that it can be, let's say you're looking for a certain destination, or maybe you've, you've, you've clicked on, a, on, a, on an app and it says, you know, I want to find all the re these restaurants in the area. And, you know, you look at it and they're all bunched together. 
And when you zoom out, so you can look at them so that there's spaces between those, those, those things that are on the computer screen, you suddenly, you're able to see specifically where it is. God, he sifts out and sees specifically everywhere we go. And, and, and you zoom out on that, that computer map, and, and God sees specifically. It's, it's not, a, it's not a, a question. It's not a clumped circumstance. God knows. And he is watching. He's aware. Now, fourthly, it says, basically, look at the next thing that it says. He says, even before there's a word in my, on my tongue, Behold, O Lord, you know it all. Now, when there's the word behold in the Bible, that means we need to pay attention. That means, aha, look closely. And he's saying, before we say something, when we're thinking it, it goes back to the idea God knows our thoughts. God is aware of what we're going to say before we say it. Or basically, to put the point down that I have in the notes, God knows what I'll say before I say it. Every word before it reaches my tongue, God knows what's going to come out of my mouth. Every thought that's deep in my mind that will be expressed, God knows. And basically, he's saying that God is fully aware of everything, every action, every reaction, everything we say, everything we do. Before we say something, God's knowledge of us is so intimate, so personal, so realistic that nothing ever catches him off guard. Nothing ever surprises him. God may be grieved by what we do. Yes, we should not grieve the Holy Spirit, Ephesians chapter 4. But God is never surprised, never shocked. And he knows what we're going to say before we say it. And just stop and think how awesome and how great that God is, or our God is, not that God, because our God is the only God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, three persons, one Godhead. But now number five, we read here, he says, you have enclosed me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. That's basically saying God knows exactly what I need. Sometimes I think, well, I need this. I want that. We can get upset with God because we think, oh, why don't I have this? Or why is this happening in my life? And we question, you know, what's God's will and how does God's will work? Well, what we find in this is God knows exactly what I need. This is passage is saying, you know, he, he's enclosed me from behind and in front. And his hand is upon me. He's basically expressing the idea that God has given us guardrails and he's given us guidelines. Guardrails and guidelines. And the question I have to ask for myself and for all of us that are listening here, how often do we create our own guardrails? How often do we set our own guidelines? How often do we do the things we want to do rather than recognize this is what God wants us to be doing? I remember when the first time I, I traveled out in the mountains of Colorado, I was on a, on a, on a charter bus was with a whole bunch of young people. It was a youth group. I was the youth pastor at the time. We were going on a ski trip. I remember as we're going up one of the mountains, and I looked out the side of the bus, and I saw that little guardrail in this huge bus. I'm thinking, that's crazy. There's no way that guardrail is going to stop this bus from going off the edge. But now God's guardrails, you know, they are set for us. But the question is, are we staying between the lines? Are we going to allow the guardrails to, to guard our, our travel, our path, so to speak, our spiritual path? Do we create our own guardrails and say, okay, this is the limit for me rather than what God says is the limit? When God says, I'm going to close you in from the front and from the back, I'm going to close you in. It's not a restriction as much as it is a protection. He wants to protect us. He gives us a sheltering protection for our lives. I mentioned two weeks ago when we were with our family, we had two babies. 
amongst us. There were um, 12 of us, and we had two babies, and uh, the two babies needed to take a nap. We didn't have a crib where we were staying, but we had a, an extra bed that was there for, for, the, for, the ba for one of the babies to, to sleep. And what do we do? We put pillows all around where the baby was going to take the nap, and Brielle took, took a, just a great nap. She slept for an hour. She was protected. She, what, she doesn't sleep in a regular bed. She sleeps in a crib. We didn't have a crib. But we put those pillows. Pillow, what, what, that was a sheltering protection for her. And that's what God does for us. He puts that sheltering protection around us to keep us hemmed in. And we, we want to follow what God desires. He knows what we need. We may want to say, well, I want this, or I want that, or I want to do these things. And God says, no, those aren't the things I want you to be doing. And we need to recognize the pillows that are there to protect us, to shelter us in that sense. Those are God's pillows I'm talking about. God knows what we need. He knows what I need. He knows what you need. But then finally, verse 6. David says, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I can't attain it. I can't grasp it. I can't lay hold of it. It's beyond my comprehension. And what we find from that is that God knows everything about us. He has infinite knowledge. God is so far beyond our way of seeing life or our way of seeing the way things work. He has an infinite perspective, and as he loves us, as he, as, he, as he knows everything about us, God loves us anyway. God knows the sin in our lives, and he sent Jesus Christ to be the Lord and Savior that would pay the penalty for my sin, for your sin, for all sin. Jesus Christ paid that price, and God knows everything about us. He knows what we're going to do. He knows why we're going to do it. He knows all those actions. And he, he loves us. I have a quote from Chuck Swindoll, and it relates to this. He says, The shameful things that you should never have done, the things I should never have done, the dreadful things that we should never have thought or participated in, he knew those things. God knows it all. The beautiful thing is that he keeps it to himself. That's called grace. And it's a great relief for all of us. God extended his grace for us in spite of the fact that he knew about our sin. He knew about our misgivings. He knew about all of the various areas where we shouldn't be involved and we shouldn't be doing those things. Now, do we have an excuse to do those? No, we don't. We should say, God knows but God provided forgiveness, and therefore God wants us to submit to his guidelines and guardrails. He knows what we need, and we should see in the scripture, how does God provide for those needs? How does God provide for those circumstances that we face that we don't know how to handle? We stay within the guardrails. We stay within the guidelines. We follow God's principles. We follow God's word. We submit to his authority. And Psalm 139 is a passage that, for all practical purposes, it tells us so clearly why it is that we worship a great God, we submit to a great God, and why it is that we should follow his, his desires. We should want to follow his will. So as we close this message, let me just express a few thoughts that kind of are takeaways. Because first off, let's realize our portrait of God, our picture of God, this, this, this beautiful drawing that David gives us from Psalm 139, tells us that we have a God that's infinite knowledge is so far beyond what we can grasp that we'll never figure that out. He knows everything. He never needs to learn. He never does learn. He has all knowledge all the time. And God is not surprised by what happens. He's not shocked by what happens. 
He's not caught off guard by what happens. When we face a crisis, when we face a challenge, God's not up in heaven wringing his hand saying, oh, what am I going to do? God has an answer. He, in fact, his answers many times are in the scriptures. The question is, am I going to follow what the scriptures say? Am I going to follow the guidelines or the guardrails that God's word gives me? Am I going to go to a person that I need to go to because there's an issue? Am I going to talk to another individual and say, okay, God's word says this, so therefore let's be doing this. He knows everything he doesn't need to learn. He doesn't need to change anything himself. But yet we need to learn. We need to see his power, his might, his infinite knowledge. And he knows the past, he knows the present, he knows the future. God knows what's happening. He knows what has happened. He knows what's happening now. He knows what's going to happen. And we're going to see later in Psalm 139 that God has ordained all the days that we will live. Now that's hard for me to grasp, but yet God has. But now as we look further, I want us to realize that a passage like Colossians 1, 15 through 20. Let me read this passage. Colossians 1, 15 through 20 where Paul writes and says, He, meaning Jesus Christ, is the image of the invisible God. We've not seen God. People during Christ's day saw Jesus Christ. He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. What does that mean? It means that Jesus Christ is the first, He, he is the priority birth of all creation, the most important birth ever. Now, Jesus Christ, he, he existed before he was born as a man. He existed before he was. But his, his birth was a priority. So he's the firstborn of all creation. It says, For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. For his glory, in other words. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. What does that mean? He is the first, the first resurrection. Now, he, rose, he raised Lazarus from the dead. There was a young lady, that he, a girl that he raised from the dead. Jesus rose those from the dead, but they were not given glorified bodies. Jesus Christ is the first person to raise from the dead that received the glorified body. And he's up in heaven, sitting at the right hand of God the Father, waiting for the trump to sound, for him to come and snatch us up and take us to heaven, the church. But as we look at this, he's the, he is the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from, from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. He is preeminent in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. The glory dwells in Jesus Christ, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of the cross, through him I say whether things on earth or things in heaven. In other words, he, he, he's, he's, he's the most important of all. And he kind of puts Psalm 139 in perspective. He knows all things. He's aware of all things. He's in charge of all things. And therefore... We find this. Now, what are the applications? As we look at all this, the, the, the rest of the applications, the last one. I've given three. I'm the fourth one. J.I. Packer, the, the great biblical scholar, the man that, that has written Knowing God and other, past, uh, other books. He says, living becomes an awesome business when you realize that you spend every moment of your life in the sight and the company of an all-knowing God. Living becomes an awesome business. When I realize that I live in the sight and the company of an all-knowing God, He knows all that I'm doing. That should change my perspective on life. The fact that He came, He sent Jesus Christ to be my Lord and Savior, and He paid the penalty, and I've trusted in Him, that changes my entire perspective. The Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of me, and I submit to the control of, and the, the filling of the Spirit so that I will follow the guidelines of God's Word. 
And that's why when we look at Psalm 139, 1 through 6, we realize that we're gaining and maintaining a practical perspective of who God is. We're getting to know ourselves because we know the God that created us. We know ourselves better. But we understand that he knows us better than we know ourselves. And therefore, I need to call on the God that knows me better than I know myself and seek his will, seek his word to guide me and to guard me. And we recognize that the one that knows us better than we know ourselves, we need to give him control of our lives. That's an essential responsibility for those of us that are followers of Christ. And for those that are not followers of Christ, if you've never trusted in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, understand, you're a sinner, just like I'm a sinner. We all fall short of God's perfect standard. But Jesus Christ came and lived a perfect, sinless life as the God-man, as the Son of Man, the Son of God. He came and lived that perfect life, and he was willing to sacrifice on the cross of Calvary in my place and in your place. So as a person who maybe hasn't trusted in Jesus Christ, I ask you, realize that Jesus died on the cross in your place and all you need to do is say, Father, I'm sorry. I'm a sinner. I want to turn from my sin. I want to turn to Jesus Christ and allow him to be my Savior and my Lord to take charge of my life. And once that happens, what well, suddenly then we realize that this all-knowing God that we're in the presence of all, on, all the time, he's watching, he's helping. He ha we have this privilege, the privilege of God watching over us. That's a wonderful blessing. I trust that this is encouraging to you. It's, it's so encouraging to me. As we face the challenges of life, I see this and I say, wow. We have a God that is fully in charge and he knows us so, so intimately. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you. I praise you. I express my gratitude to you. Your blessings are far beyond what I can ever deserve. Your word, it is filled with riches that tell me of the inheritance that I have in heaven. Tell me of the ways in which you are my shepherd, that you watch over me, you walk me through the pastures, you help me find the still waters where I can be restored, you help me to walk through the valley of the shadow of death, where even though there's evil around me, I have your rod and staff protecting me, they're comforting me. I praise you for that, Father, and I ask that everyone that's hearing this prayer right now, they'll realize the same thing. I ask your blessing over our church. Help us through some challenging times. Help us to be able to honor you. I pray for those that are facing other needs, other difficulties. I ask that you might provide the blessing that's necessary, Father, for every person. And that they might see you as the provider through your grace and your mercy. So thank you. Bless us, guide us, and help us, Father, I pray in Jesus' name. And again, all God's people say... Amen and amen. Hey, thanks for watching. Thanks for being part. I trust that this is, well, it's encouraging to me. I hope it's encouraging to you too. I look forward to hearing from you. I look forward to seeing you come and visit, come and be here for services. And again, thank you for your involvement. Thank you for your prayers. And I'll just say I'm praying for all of, all of, all of you that are watching that I, that, that, that I know I don't know who's watching, obviously, but those that I know personally, I'm praying for you. So thank you, Lord bless, and we'll look forward to seeing you again soon.